it sounds like. It sounds like a pretty dry, uh, dry, boring, or dry, boring topic. We'll see. I want to start with this quote, uh, quotation from Chaucer. Yekinoi ek, case pronounced, Yekinoi ek, that in form of speech is change. Within a thousand year and more is low, that hardened priest, no wonder nice and stranger, us thinketh, sorry, I can't read that, him, and yet they spake him so, and sped as well in love as men do now, uh, now do. So, so, you know also that in form of speech is change. Manner speech, how one speaks. Within a thousand year, words then that had price, that is meaning, now they're wondrously nice and strange. Nice there means very few know what their meanings are. For example, much of Chaucer's language today. All right? Us think of them, that is, we now think of them, those old words, etc., as nice and strange. And yet they spake them so, and sped as well, that is, succeeded as well. Notice what Chaucer is implying here is the purpose of language to succeed in love. That's the purpose of language. Okay? He's being facetious, obviously. So, let's go back to what we need to get to and look at the syllabus. But I wanted to begin with that because notice that is Chaucer saying, um, now I want to turn the lights down a little, just a little bit. That is Chaucer saying just before 1400, so over 600 years ago, that he realized the nature of language is to change. Okay? And yet we still, in 2019, have people who want to suggest language shouldn't change, and we can somehow freeze language. We can stop it from changing. We can stop new words from coming in, we can stop old words from changing their meaning. Okay? The French are especially good at this. They still try to do this. They still try to regulate what words can enter the, English, the, the French language. It's, it's utterly ridiculous, but we'll talk about that. Um, okay, so I'm Dr. Sherman. My office is on the other side of Peck Hall. Which color is that wall? It's the one with in the corner. I think it's orange. It's either orange or red. Um, 352 is my office number. Go in one of the office blocks and take a left, take a right, and it's back in the corner on the right. Peck Hall 352. I put my phone number down, but I don't answer it, so don't call. Um, I've, I've literally not answered the phone in a couple of years because all I was getting was somebody trying to sell me stocks or insurance or coffins or cemetery plots, you know. I'm not that old, but I'm getting there. Um, best way to reach me is via the email that's there or D2L. I don't check D2L as often as I do this, but I'm getting um, better at it because I'm having more and more students using D2L to email, especially as MTSU kind of regulates more and more its electronic um, cyberspace presence. It's getting harder for students for some reason to email this address from an MTSU domain. For example, I don't think you can email that address from D2L. I don't think it'll go out. So uh, I, I'll check it periodically throughout the day. Office hours, I know it says 7.15, I'm here by 7 o'clock um, to 9, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 7 o'clock to 7.55, 7.50, Tuesday, Thursday, by appointment. The required text is this one, okay, and I sent out that email, hopefully you um, saw it, you know, and I include this because you can rent this for, it's like 30 bucks. If you buy it, it's what, 160? Which is why I've not used this in probably seven or eight years, because I've just rebelled against requiring students to shell out 160 bucks for it. 
under 300 page, eh, just over 300 page textbook when this doesn't cost them but dollars to produce. It's all part of the, the textbook racket. Um, this is the seventh edition. If you get a sixth edition, that's fine. Probably if you get a fifth edition, that's fine. Why? Well, we've been talking about you know the language changes, but between the seventh edition and the fifth edition, the language hasn't changed that much. And what we know about language change hasn't changed that much. I think the last time I taught this course, in fact, um, I bought a whole bunch of used fifth editions. And then I either sold them or rented them to students if they wanted them. Or told them, you can get these off Amazon for yourself. But I rented them for cheaper, like five bucks, um, for the semester. The electronic edition, as I said, is uh, to buy is also, I think, about the same price as renting the hardback, 30 bucks or so. Um, nice thing about that, infinitely searchable, as opposed to, you know, this kind of searching. So, whichever one, um, that's the required textbook. I will not make a lot of references to this in class. I will point out some. The notes that you will be given, for example, the notes um, that are already up are notes based on this, but they're kind of supplemental to it, okay? Um, and as I said, I think with the email when I posted those notes, as we go into the semester, the notes will become less filled out. They'll become more and more outlined so that you supply more and more of the material based upon um, what is done in class. Okay? Disclaimer, everything in here is um, subject to revision, meaning we might get behind. Those of you who had me before know there's no might to it. We will um, get behind because, you know, we get into the Indo-European stuff I just love, and I'll, we'll go off on a rabbit trail and chase some linguistic group, and we'll get behind. Um, but if we do, all those kind of changes will be announced in class, so you need to keep track of it that way. Everything I do in here, starting with today, is recorded and put up on YouTube. So if you miss class, you can go to the YouTube playlist that day. Give me a few hours. That day, and it'll be, um, it'll be up there. Okay. Uh, in the morning before class, check your MTSU, either email or the D2L. If I need to cancel class, and I know I put by 7 a.m. Uh, for this class because we meet at 8 a.m., that'll be by 6 o'clock in the morning. If I've got to cancel class because I'm sick, if we've had snow or I, not half inch. Okay. Snow's got to be snow. It's, you step on it, you can't see the ground anymore got to be at least an inch. Or if everything's closed. I mean, I know the county, there's a snowflake. Ah, you know. um, if there's inclement weather, I'll notify you by 6 o'clock. I'll put a D2L announcement up and send an email via D2L. Okay? Students with disabilities, you know who you are, you know what you got to do. Enough said. Um, let's see. Cell phones, laptops, all that kind of stuff. I never used to include this, but I have to now because it's become more of a problem. And one of my colleagues raised it just about a week or so ago, which is why I um, added this. <clears throat> Use of, and I've had something like this before, but not as extensive. Use of cell phones for calls, texting, selfies, etc. don't. Yes, selfies. I had a student, some of you heard this last fall. I had a student a year ago, fall of 17, who sat in, his, in one of the classrooms facing this direction with individual desks. She sat back here, and I'm not kidding, first month of the, of the semester, every day, she's sitting there taking selfies. I'm like, what are you doing? <coughs> taking selfies, posting them on the... Don't! She ended up like with a D minus in the course. Um, don't, don't, okay? Um, if you're a first responder, EMT, cop fire, uh, etc., 
let me know. Have your cell phone pager um, out. Just have it on silent so it vibrates. Similarly, and this you know will apply, I am sure, to somebody. I would say, God forbid, but he won't because it's going to happen. Um, if you have a family emergency, either if you have one now or if one arises during the semester, okay, uh, somebody goes into the hospital, somebody's been in a car accident, somebody develops cancer, all three happen just about every semester, okay? Somebody has a heart attack. Um, let me know. I shouldn't be the first person, obviously, you call, okay? Get, get the situation, get to the person in the hospital, et cetera. But within 24 hours, let me know. And I will do everything in my feeble power that I have to ensure that you can continue the class. Continue and finish the class, right? But you got to let me know soon, immediately, within 24 hours. Um, if something happens 1st of February, you've got a parent, grandparent, brother, sister, loved one who goes into the hospital and it's just throwing your whole life, you know, into a tumult and you can't come to class or whatever and you don't notify me until after spring break. Sorry. I mean, I'll be sorry and I'll pray for you and your friend, loved one, whatever, but you've already dug your grave by that point. Okay. Um, so you got to know... I, I had somebody last last fall, close family member, died just before the semester began or right after the semester began. And that person, I think, attended maybe five classes. But followed along on YouTube, did the required assignments, did not do them well, okay, but passed, barely passed the class, okay. But I had another student, similar kind of thing, the, the situation with a family member, I think, happened a little bit later in the semester, but didn't let me know. And it was about two weeks before the end of the semester. Sorry, I've not been around. I've been fighting, blah, 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 because. And I was like, why didn't you let me know before? Because now there's nothing really we can do about it. Okay? So let me know. Um, and if that's the case, I'll tell you, have your phone out. Just have it on vibrate. If your phone starts to and I see you get up and leave, no questions asked. Okay? If I know what's going on, no questions asked. All right? um, laptops, all that kind of stuff. Strongly discourage the use of laptops and tablets for note taking. And I've included this language before, but I've never included links to the studies. All right? um, there have been a number of studies, and these are, there's what, six there? Five there. These are just five kind of um, articles, analyses of studies. There are a whole lot more that show when you take notes by hand with pen or pencil, um, your retention of that material that you're taking the notes of is about 50% greater than if you're doing this. Because when you're doing this, you're acting like a recorder. You're simply transcribing everything you hear. That means you're not filtering it. When you're writing like this, your brain says, I don't need a the. And so you leave those definite articles out, and you leave out all those conjunctions. You're just doing what? You're writing down the really important words, the nouns, the verbs, adjectives, adverbs, those sort of things. Right? But... That doesn't mean you can't use laptops, computers, etc. to take notes. If that's what you want to do, do it. Just make sure you're using it to take notes. Because if somebody who sits behind you sends me an email or comes to me, because I've had both of these happen multiple times, and say, you know, so-and-so isn't taking notes. So-and-so is buying Amazon during class or surfing Instagram or Facebook or porn, you know, as I've had happen in a class. <laughs> I will talk to you and say, don't bring it anymore. And if you do, I'll send your name to Student Affairs. And they will probably remove you from the class. Okay? That's what's happened in the past. All right. 
Um, classroom decorum. Decorum is not a word we hear very much in 2019 America. What's it mean? Proper behavior. Okay? So, attendance, participation, and decorum are expected. What does these mean? They mean, one, I know it's an 8 o'clock class. It's early. But you arrive on time. Okay? Um, arriving after class has begun is rude, disrespectful, disruptive, especially doesn't apply to this classroom because this door doesn't automatically lock afterwards. But if we were in 308, which is where I also sometimes teach, about 15 minutes after class is set to begin, that door automatically locks. So somebody will arrive at, you know, 15 minutes late, and that means I've got to go open the door. I've gotten to the point where I don't. I just, <laughs> hello, wave, and et cetera. So arrive on time. Two, you're quiet, you pay attention to me if I'm talking, or to somebody else if somebody else is talking. All right? Uh, you're courteous to others. That kind of is same as number two, but it also means if you disagree with what somebody else says, you don't call that person an idiot, a moron. Uh, you, you don't go all Trump on them, in other words. Okay? So you're courteous, respectful. It doesn't mean you can't disagree, by the way. I encourage disagreement. I encourage good, healthy exchange of ideas. Why? Not all ideas are equal. Mind-blowing idea. Not all opinions are equal. Not all opinions are valid. Some opinions are downright stupid. The earth is flat. No, it's not. <laughs> Neil Armstrong never st stepped foot on the moon. Yes, he did. You know, I mean, there are... Okay. Um, what else? When speaking in class, you should use language appropriate to the setting. No swearing or foul language. And I know every now and then I throw out a damn or hell or et cetera. Sometimes a little bit worse. It'll be in context. But no F-bombs. Uh, I've had students in classes before. It sounded like they'd thrown a few back and been at a bar. Okay, None of that here. Don't eat during class. Have breakfast before. Have breakfast in your next class, but not this one. Um, afterwards. Don't sleep during class. The last couple of years, I've not had as much a problem with this. Um... But I will publicly shame you. I, I used to have a student, this, I don't know, this was relatively soon after I started here, I don't know, five, within five years of my first being here. And I had a student who would come in every morning. Now, this was a seven o'clock class. Okay? I actually only had eight students in that class, or eight students who finished. I think it started with like 20. Um, and this guy would come in, and every morning, he would take the desk directly in front of me. And he'd come in, no book, no notebook, nothing. He'd come in and put his head down and go to sleep. And almost every morning I'd come in and do that, like that, to where I picked the table off the floor and his head would jump up. And within 15 minutes, he'd be back asleep again. Had another instance, a different one, a late afternoon class. Warm, hot room. And this one student one day, I mean, I have five minutes, and he was just sawing logs, just snoring like a chainsaw. And I just kind of got everybody's attention. Went, and we all just left. I said, just cancel class. He needs to sleep. And I don't think he fell asleep any day after that. Okay? So don't sleep in class. Um, don't do homework or assignments for other classes in this class. And almost all of this, by the way, comes from the student handbook. This isn't me being, you know, rotten old nasty, you know, Sherman, etc. I mean, it's some of it's modified, but this is all stuff student affairs will say, well, of course you shouldn't do that. And the reason I've never really included all this is because I shouldn't have to, but things have gotten bad with some students, so I do. For example, like, don't wear headphones in class. At a student last fall, he would come in with his beats on and wouldn't take them off. Every now and then I'd walk over 
towards where he was. It's like he's sitting over there where Tess is. And I could hear the music. And I'd go, yeah? <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, go back to your own world. Uh, but don't do that. And lastly, and again, it should go without saying, don't cheat or plagiarize from another's work. One of the first times I taught this course, I was still a doctoral student at Southern Mississippi, and I was teaching it at our satellite campus down on the golf course. And one of the students, it was an undergraduate graduate course, and one of the students was a graduate student, um, wife of a local minister, and I had this kind of language on there. You know, don't plagiarize from, you know, uh, other students. Don't plagiarize from the books that we used. And I, I specifically said, don't plagiarize from our textbook. And I'm not kidding. She lifted an entire page. An entire page straight out of the book. And I was like, how stupid do you think I am? Um, she didn't do it. So if you don't abide by these guidelines, I'll talk to you. If you keep doing it, I'll then refer you to student affairs. You'll be removed from the course, etc. Okay? We meet twice a week. We cover a ton of material. Um, I'm, we'll actually, by the end of Thursday of this week, we'll be a little bit ahead. Because we're going to go through some of this language background stuff quickly. Um, but... We cover a lot of material, so it's really in your best interest not to miss it. Caveat there is everything's recorded, it's on, on YouTube, but you can't interact with YouTube. I mean, you can't respond, tell me I'm an idiot, etc., etc. But then again, that would go against the be courteous to others, so don't do that. Um, so, you're given two absences. Use them or don't use them. Bank them for in case you get sick later in the semester. Or say, I'm healthy, I'm young, I'm not going to die. I'm going to get wasted on a Monday night, and I'm not going to come into class Tuesday morning. Well, you get two. The third one lowers your grade. One letter. So you take your two, or you take one, and you get pneumonia later in the semester. Well, that's going to really suck. <laughs> because if you get pneumonia, you're going to miss more than one class. And if you've used your two, and you miss one, that means even if you are the star A student, your grade's going to drop. Okay. Um, fourth absence, you fail the course. Why? Because you've missed, what is it, one-seventh of the semester essentially. Okay? Um, if you're not present either when roll is taken or a quiz is given, you'll be counted absent. I am not going to take roll every day. I will take roll every day for the first couple weeks. Why? Because the federal government has its nasty little tentacles into every classroom and we have to for financial aid reporting purposes. We have to show that you're here and you deserve the aid that you are giving uh, or being given. But probably come middle of February, if I take roll, it'll be every other day. And so you do the crapshoot. Is he going to take roll today? Can I skip? Um, but if there's a quiz and you're not here, it's just a zero. Okay. And no makeup quizzes. Right. Um, if I've given the quiz out and you come in and there's a couple minutes left, for everybody who's already taking the quiz, I'll hand you the quiz and I'll tell you. You got about two minutes. I'm not going to give you additional time so that you have the same amount of time they have, because if you had arrived on time, you would have had the same amount of time. Okay? Um, I don't know why I have your papers are due at the beginning of the class. Probably because I copy and paste stuff from syllabi to syllabi. Um, but your paper, singular, is due on the day that it is due at the beginning of class, which is April 16th. Right. Um, unapproved late papers will receive an F. If you completely forget, I don't know why you would, but if you completely forget that there is a paper due, 
and you come to class on April 16th and you see everybody fumbling with papers and you're like, Um, one, do panic. <laughs> Two, still write the paper. Turn it in the next week. All right? Why? Because if you don't turn the paper in, you automatically fail the course. So even if you turn it in a week late, a week and a half late, you'll get an F, yes. I won't read it. You'll get an F. But... You can still pass the course if you have one F. Why? Because an F isn't a zero. When, I, when a student earns an F on something in one of my classes, that F is 55 points. For example, the first exam. Somebody, and I'm saying this based upon experience, somebody will earn about 23 points out of 100 on that first exam. Well, when you get that exam back from me, it'll look like this at the top. It'll have 23, and then I'll do this. That 23 just became a 55. Why? Because I'm nice. That 23, that's almost like a zero. That would almost totally sink you. That's a pretty deep hole to dig out of. But a 55 isn't. And almost all of the exams will have extra credit material on them. Anywhere from 10 to 30 points possible. Now, it's not necessarily easy extra credit. It's all based on stuff in class. And I might give an, an out-of-class extra credit um, opportunity, too. I just haven't uh, decided yet. All right? Everything, all the classes, as I said, will be... Um, Uploaded to that YouTube uh, YouTube channel. Um, see, that's all stuff that should have been deleted, so just skip over that. Grading. Grading's pretty easy. Total number of points that you earn divided by the total number of points possible gives me a number. And that number falls somewhere between 0 and 100. Right? It's 89.4. Well, that's a B plus, unless you've been a really active participant in class. Okay, you've responded. I have to qualify this a little bit. You responded intelligently <laughs> to two questions. I mean, just blurting everything that comes to your mind is not being an intelligent, active participant. But you've been engaged. You've been involved. That eighty nine point four that might jump up to a 90, okay? If you've come here and you've been like this desk every day, totally unresponsive, catatonic, where I feel like I've got to bring in a fibrillator and, you know, zap you back to life, yeah, that 89.4, that's not going to go up at all. It, in fact, might drop down a little bit. It won't drop down. It'll stay at 89.4, in which case it stays a B. Where that's really important is like there and here. And, okay. If you have a 59.5, that's a 60. But if you have a 59.4 and you've tried, okay, that might bump up to a D minus. I know, mentally, D minus F, really, what's the difference? Well, one's passing <laughs> and one isn't, okay? Um, schedule, all that kind of stuff. See, just skip everything after daily class reading. <laughs> because I have included chapters 10 to 12 in the uh, syllabus. So, today, introduction syllabus, we're going to do some other um, stuff related to language uh, fundamentals, which is in the textbook chapters 1 and 2. Um, so today's the 15th. We'll finish this probably on Thursday, so we'll be one day ahead, and then more than likely we'll get a little bit behind um, in the next unit, which is a brief history of writing, because I've got three days assigned for history of writing.
we might get behind her. If not, we'll definitely get behind in this part. Backgrounds of English. Um, this is Indo-European culture, language, etc. The forerunners, the people, not quite far in the spec, but pretty far back, that are the progenitors of all the Germanic languages, all the Celtic languages, all the Greek languages, all the Romance languages, all the Slavic languages, all the Indian languages, not Native American, but oh, he's kind of Indian, you know, um, etc. Right? And then we'll have our first exam, hopefully, everything going on time, February 19th. Then we jump into Old English. We have four days for Old English. Might get behind. Depends on uh, how much detail I try to go into. I used to teach Old English in Beowulf at the graduate level. Um, it stopped a couple of years ago, and so I, you know, I might get my fix by giving you more. Um, and then we go to the Middle English and then Early Modern English, Late Modern English. We might get into the late 19th, early 20th centuries. I used to have a, a, um, a unit, per se, in here on American English, American dialects, um, modern, you know, variously called... Um, Black English, African American vernacular English, Creoles and, and pigeons. I don't know how much we'll get into that. Um, but notice I've got three assignments there, March 12th, March 21st, and I've moved this one in my syllabus, um, April 2nd. Lord's Prayer reading, okay? This, the one for April 2nd, you can move down to... What did I do, the ninth? Yeah. Earliest that'll be due is April 9th. I just did that just before class. What is that? That doesn't mean you just come in and read the Lord's Prayer to me. Why? Because, you know, any five-year-old could do that. No. You're going to come in and you're going to recite for me. And I just do the Lord's Prayer because it's a nice thing because we have it. In Old English, Middle English, and Early Modern English. You're going to do it in Old English. And then you're going to do it in Middle English, which is a little bit different. It's not much different. And then you're going to do it in Early Modern English. What do we mean by Early Modern English? Shakespeare. Shakespeare's language. Okay? And what will be interesting is the Old English will be really hard for you to wrap your mind around. Okay? But when you get to the Middle English and the Early Modern English, what your mind will tell you when you're practicing it, your mind's going to direct you back to the old English form and not the modern, today English form. Why? Because it's like there is something in our minds that remembers this earlier form of the language. Like there's this fossil up there, and it's just, you know, Needs for you to awaken it, you know. Okay, so you're gonna you you'll do you know the Lord's reading, uh, Lord's prayer, Old English. Before March 12th, on or before March 12th, so it's any time up to then. The um, Middle English, for any time between the time you do the old, the Old English and that day. And again, I might adjust that date. Um, a little bit also, right? I'll put up some links. There's a bazillion sound files of Old English on the internet, okay? Um, I'll put up a reading of the Lord's Prayer in Old English. I've already got one in Middle English, but it's not very good because I was sick when I did it. Um, and the Early Modern English. I'll put up links to other stuff also, pronunciation-wise, in those three time periods. Right? Because, for example, it's really interesting to hear Shakespeare or Shakespeare's plays or language in its original pronunciation. Why? Because some of Shakespeare's sonnets, for example, don't rhyme today. 
because the sounds have changed between Shakespeare's day and our day, all right? Um, so when we get down to here, April 11, chapters 9, 10, and 11, all of those really have to do with, or 10, 11, and 12, I guess, um, yeah, not 9, 10, 11, and 12, have to do with vocabulary, the lexicon of modern English. How do the words that we have today become the words that we have today? Where do we get our words from? And, and some of it's about influence of older languages, and we'll be talking about those as we go. For example, when we get to the Old English period, we'll talk about how Latin began influencing the Germanic languages before the Germanic peoples ever even moved to England, or what became England, to Britain. For example, the word dish, modern English word dish, that entered the Germanic languages <clears throat> back when all the Germanic peoples still lived in Northern Europe. Where's it come from? It comes from Latin, ultimately comes from Greek. Latin, discus. Like in the Olympics, track and field events, you have a discus thrower. What's he throw? It's a thing that looks like a disc. Okay? That's where the word dish comes from. So how in the world did some Latin speaker who talked about a discus meet some German and it get borrowed? Well, the Latin... Uh, Roman legions fairly regularly were fighting against the German barbarians and they eventually kind of they eventually kind of reached a truce on the frontier to where there was trade going on okay so you had that word enter you had the word for wine enter at the same time you had the word for street enter at the same time. Why? Who made streets? Romans. Germans didn't. They didn't pave anything. They walked around in muddy tracks. Okay? The Romans, however, introduced paved roads. And this is where kind of the, the study of the history of the English language gets really interesting. We're not we're not doing this solely so that you understand. This is how our language changes <laughs> me. It's towards a a purpose, okay? And that purpose is to better understand texts. All of this is called philology. Philology means love of words, love of language, okay? It's historical philology. It's historical English. But what's the point of it? Not to just understand how words become what they are today. The point of it is to better understand how words are used in written texts. This class, for example, should enable you by the end of the semester to, you know, when you pick up a text written in an earlier period, a poem written, say, in the early 19th century by a romantic poet, where you can look at a word and go, that looks like it means modern meaning, and yet you'll go, it does. I think it has a earlier meaning. That is, a poet writing, you know, Shelley writing in 1800 actually has an older idea for a word than what we now um, mean by it, right? So, term paper due the 16th. Uh, those are, you know, if you want to drop, but nobody in here will want to drop. Um, assignments. Three tests. Uh, the first one was the Unit 1 exam on February 19th, Language Fundamentals, History of Writing, and the Indo-European stuff, the backgrounds of English. The second one is Old and Middle English, uh, March 26th, and then a final exam. Okay? The final exam will primarily cover everything from Old and Middle English forward. 
it will have a little bit from the earlier periods, right? Like maybe 20%. Um, so three exams, one paper, quizzes. So at least 400 points plus whatever quizzes, okay? Um, plus, I haven't determined how much these will count for, the um, readings of the Lord's Prayer in Old, Middle, and Early Modern English. Papers, explanation of a topic, issue, and the history of the English language that you find intellectually stimulating. Hopefully you will find something in here intellectually stimulating. Okay, So what are you going to do? You're going to write an 8 to 10 page paper on that topic. Okay, Research scholarly paper. you got to get my approval before. Don't come in the Thursday before the Tuesday that it's due and go, I want to write on. Because... A weekend is not long enough for this kind of paper. Um, seven secondary critical sources. Um, yeah, some of this, like, again, copying and pasting doesn't really um, work with this one because everything you're going to do is essentially secondary sources. Uh, it's, it's all going to be critical because you're not writing about a primary source per se. Unless you do some reading of something. We can talk about that individually. So you got comments there about what the paper should look like, etc. What it should not look like, this kind of thing. Um, and let me throw this out. I had two or three people, I can't remember which, in one of my classes last fall, and this kind of goes back to the earlier comment about making sure you turn in assignments, um, who I got their final exams, and I was grading term papers, and I had their final exams, and I was grading term papers, and I came to where a name should be, and there was no paper. And I went to, and well, they took the final exam, but the person didn't turn in the term paper. Really made it easy on me, because I didn't need to grade the final exam, because a person already failed the course by not doing the, um, the paper. So why did I, how did I get there? Because when I grade the papers, I look for certain things to begin with. A title. If you don't have a title, I give you one. <laughs> that means I don't read it. Literally, I don't read it. Okay? I said you had to have seven secondary sources. That means you have to have at least seven sources for your paper. After I look to see if you have a title, I'm going to turn to the works cited page. If you don't have seven sources, you get an F. Why? You can't follow directions. 90% of success in life. Um, and then, you know, other stuff there. So, let me skip over some of that. And you have some stuff about paraphrases and all that kind of nonsense. So, here are some possible paper topics. Origins of language. Dozens and dozens of books have been written about how did language arise? What's the problem with that? We don't know. Yeah, well, it's a really broad topic, but we don't know. Anthropologists have tons of ideas, but no proof, right? So it's pretty broad. Origins and development of writing. Ah, that one we do have evidence for. That is where it arose. And you could add, I don't think I have one. You could add, you know, as an offshoot of that, Undeciphered scripts. That is, we have a bunch of scripts, S C R I P T S, I don't know if I'm saying that word, that we don't know what it means. We've got a, a bunch of things that apparently have writing on them, but we can't decipher the writing. And it would be really, really cool to know what this thing says, right? So you can put there also, you know, undeciphered scripts as a, as a topic. Indo-European homeland. Where did these people come from? That is, what is there, the Indo-European language group, the peepers of the, the speakers of what's called Proto-Indo-European? Where did they originally come from? Because there's really today, there's only about three main geographical areas that people think they moved out of, okay? 
Which is it? Which one's the right one? You'll see. I'll really get into this. I, I took, when I was working on my doctoral degree, I took a course in um, Foundations of Indo-European Thought and Culture. The anthropology course. And the guy who taught it, um, name was Sean Wynn. Uh, been trained at UC Berkeley, I think in UCLA. Um, the guy was a genius. I mean, spoke half dozen languages, raised by parents who, if I remember right, were deaf mutes. And he spoke like half a dozen. And he would regale us with, you know, some of his experiences. Because he was an anthropologist, he also did archaeology about, you know, quote unquote, adventures he had in the Hindu Kush. In various parts of Azerbaijan, etc., you know, being captured by uh, they weren't terrorists at that time, uh, being captured by Mujahideen, for example, in Afghanistan, who were getting ready to kill him. But he could speak to them in their language, you know, white guy speaking fluently their language, and you know, walked away. But he brought to class one day a shoebox, and he started putting out on this desk in front of him these artifacts. These artifacts were from like five to 7,000 BC. Pieces of ceramic, pieces of stone that all had markings on them, all from digs that he had conducted, all with examples of proto-writing. That is not quite writing, but almost writing, but we don't know what any of the symbols meant. Okay. Um, Celtic influence on English. I mean, Britain before the Romans was what? Celtic. It was all Celtic. And yet we only today have about 20 Celtic words in the entire English vocabulary of nearly depending on what estimate you use, a million to two million words. We have one very prominently located right near us, the Cumberland River. Coom is a Celtic word. Okay? Crag, C-R-A-G-G, -G, Celtic word. Okay? Latin influence on English, out the wazoo. Germanic invasions of Britain. These are the original Germanic invasions of Britain in 449. We'll talk about that. Influence of Old Norse on English. What is Old Norse? Anybody know? Language of the Vikings. So you can get on Netflix and you can watch the Viking show, which is really bad. But you can, you know, it's the language spoken by the Vikings. We speak Viking every day. When you get in the shower, and you wash this stuff, this stuff, your skin, that's Viking. Okay? These things, though our word for them, it's Viking eye. This thing behind the shade, window, vindalga. The eye of the wind. Why? Because it wasn't glass and windows during the Viking era. If they had a timber hut or a timber home, there would be a hole and it would have shutters. But when the shutters were open, what happened? The wind blew through. Okay? This, these things, nose thrills, nostril, it's the nose hole. Okay? So almost every word that begins with sk in English, it's Viking. Every time you use a third person plural pronoun, they, their, them, you're speaking Viking. That's not native Old English. The native Old English gets replaced by the Viking form. It's interesting because the Old Norse introduction into English. It's the only um, it's the only language that actually changes the grammar of English. 
Latin doesn't, and French doesn't, but Norse does. Why? Probably because they're so closely related. An Anglo-Saxon speaker and an Old Norse speaker could parse their way through a conversation like a deep southern Mississippi speaker can communicate with a Cockney English speaker. They're using very widely different vocabularies, and the sounds are not very close, but they can make their way. Right? Um, influence of Cadman. We'll talk about Cadman when we get up there on the Old English Poetry. Those of you who have suffered through my English 3010 course, you've heard about that before. Late West Saxon dialect. That's a dialect of Old English. Influence of the Norman Conquest on the English uh, language. As you will see, I don't think it's all that great. Yes? You had mentioned something earlier about the Creole. Mm -hmm. Was there, is there an influence of, from the Creole language to the English language? Uh, yeah. I mean, in, in, if you're talking about Creole as in late 19th, early 20th century Creole, yeah, in terms of today there is. Okay. I mean, we have some borrowings and some influences in terms of lexicon, in terms of the vocabulary. Um, Norman Conquest, William the Conqueror, 1066, huge influx of French words, changes a lot, and because of that, doesn't change the grammar, changes the spelling. We'll talk about spelling quite a bit. Influence of the Viking invasion, that kind of goes back to the Old Norse. Foreign influences on the English lexicon, pick one. Don't, don't do all of them, because you don't have that much space. Latin, French, Old Norse, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic. Arabic is responsible for one of the dirtiest words in the English language, algebra. We wouldn't have algebra if it weren't for Arabic. We also wouldn't have zero, the numerical concept of zero. Okay, comes from the Arabs. Native American. Almost zilch. What Native American words do we use? Mississippi, Alabama, Illinois, New York, no, Tennessee, okay, place names, and what else? Animal names squirrel, raccoon. Moose, right? Um, linguistic fossils in modern English. Who in the world? Everybody knows what a fossil is, right? You put a bone in the ground, you cover it up with mud, you let it sit for a couple million years, and it hardens, the bone gets rotted away, and rock forms in its place. I can take you to the creek behind my house and show you 300 million year old fossils in that creek, right? How do you have linguistic fossils? Yes, no. I mean, Latin is a dead language. How about this? Can I use one of these words? No. The word late. What's the purpose of the final E? What does the final E do in that word? It changes the pronunciation of the A. Changes the pronunciation of the A, Trevor says. Why? Because that's what every good American school teacher teaches his or her charges in grade school. How does it change the pronunciation? What does it make? This. Long. Lie. <laughs> that is a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> that does not make that A long. That is a linguistic fossil. Why? Because, you go back to the Old English period, that wasn't the final letter of the word. There was something else. That's just what's left. So all those final silent E's, every one of them is a fossil. It doesn't serve any good purpose today. So why do we keep them? Just try and change them. We've had people try spelling reform, which is another topic down here, okay? Influence of printing 
on standard English. We'll talk about that. Lost my place. It's there. Um, language of the KG, uh, King James Version of the Bible and its influence. Okay? Just pick up, a, I don't care what you think about the Bible, etc. Pick up a version of the Bible and read Psalm 50 or 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy great mercy. Psalm of David after sleeping with Bathsheba, killing her husband, etc. Read that in the King James Version, and then I challenge you to read it in any other more modern English version, and tell me that the more modern English version is more beautiful. Uh -uh. There is a resonance and a rhythm to the King James prose that just knocks everybody else uh, out of the water. Uh, Shakespeare's English pronunciation, Renaissance defense of English, that is, there were people writing in Shakespeare's day saying, we ought to use English. Down with Latin, up with English, etc. Okay? Prescriptive grammarians. What does prescriptive mean? Pre, it means on behalf of. You can, it's not, uh, people in support of rules, such as, give me a grammar rule. The E makes the A long, okay? That's one. Never end a sentence with a preposition. Why not? Why? Why? Because, I don't know, I'm a Spanish major, you don't end sentences with prepositions in Spanish. Because in Latin, a preposition is what? Think of the word. Preposition. It comes before. Always. In Latin, a preposition cannot. It's impossible to have it at the end of a sentence. So why can't we in English? Because <laughs> no. English isn't a romance language. And who decided it? A guy named Bishop Loaf in the 18th century who said you should not end a sentence with a preposition. Why? Because you can't in Latin. Notice the huge kind of leap he made there. Okay. Well, he's also the guy who said, don't use a double negative. Why? Because in math, two negatives make a positive. And yet if you read Chaucer and you read Shakespeare, they both use triple negatives. <laughs> What's the purpose of the double and triple negative? It's emphasis. I really, really, really don't want you to do this, okay? So it's applying Latin grammar, which is romance, and mathematical rules to the English language, which is a Germanic language, and is not mathematical, okay? Um, that's prescriptive grammarians. Influence of Samuel Johnson's dictionary. Johnson was the writer of what's frequently called the first real true dictionary. That is, he came up with the idea of not just having the spelling of a word and its meaning, meaning, but what part of speech is it? And how is it used? He gives context for the meaning of the word. And shows you. Now, I'll pull in an abridged version of Johnson's dictionary and I'll read you some of Johnson's definitions. They're completely idiosyncratic. I mean, how he defines oats, for example. He's just taking a slam at the Scots. He says something like oats, a plant which in England is used to feed the animals, but in Scots, in Scotland, is a staple for humans. And he's essentially saying Scots are like animals. Okay? And he has others for like, you know, patron, because his patron didn't properly support him while he was working on the show. So, um... It's from him that we get the great definition of a patriot. Uh, Noah Webster on American English. It's because of Noah Webster that we spell defense, D-E-F-E-N-S-E. -E. And in England, it's spelled C-E. It's because of Webster that we spell theater, T-H-E-A-T-E-R. 
and in England, R-E, unless you want to pretend that you are a higher, better, more upscale American, in which case you build theaters, R-E-S, okay? Or we throw on an E on the word point. If you're building a complex, then it's called central point, because the E somehow makes it look smarter, okay? It's because of Webster that we spell color C-O-L-O-R, and we drop the U. Yes, he says. What's the U for? We don't use it. Get rid of it. C, that doesn't make any sense. But notice, C there is pronounced how? What's it before? An E. So why don't we say sat? Or sot, C-O-T. Hmm. We'll talk about that, okay? Where am I? Uh, 19th century Indo-European linguistics, Grimm's Law. You're going to hate Grimm's Law. Uh, varieties of English, Scots English, Caribbean English, African American vernacular English, or Black English. Take your pick, okay? There's tons of them. Um, Australian English, Kiwi English, you know. American migrations, immigration, dialects, and or, notice that's pretty broad, Americanisms. Here's an example of an Americanism. Humongous. That's a great American word. Okay. Migrations. How do the migrations affect the dialects? How many of you are native Southerners? Show of hands. Most of you. Unless you've heard me say where I'm from, and if you have, don't answer. Where do you think I'm from? Based on my speech, my dialect. Do I sound like a native southerner? No. Do I sound like I'm from New York? No. Louisiana? No. Florida? Ah, see, Florida is kind of interesting. Because Florida, you have deep southern Florida, Miami-Dade, in which case the accents are primarily what? Mm, either Cuban or Haitian or New York, New Jersey, okay? And then you have Northern Florida, Redneck Florida, <laughs> which is where my wife's from. And then you have Central Florida, Disney, okay? California. Kind of, di you know, the, the California dialect is called the kind of General Western, depending upon the part of California. If you are a, primarily, a girl in the San Fernando Valley in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you had the Valley Girls speak. Separate dialect almost entirely. Thank God it's, you know, dying. That's a change we can look forward to, okay? Um, English spelling and pronunciation. I should make my kids watch this. Those, that's it. F O L K. Those three words. How do you pronounce those? How do you pronounce this one? Say it again. Talk. Some of you I'm hearing talk, 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 and others I'm hearing talk, like tick tock. Does it rhyme with that, T-O-C-K? Historically, yes it does. Those L's were never pronounced. So why do some people today, like my four kids, Say, Dad, you're wrong. It's talk. It's egg yolk. It's folk. It's because of this. Take the and of. Spelling, pronunciation. Well, there's a letter there. It ought to be pronounced. Okay. Then let's go all <laughs> Monty Python. <laughs> Call that. A connect. 
or as it was pronounced in Old English, nicht. In Old English, every letter is pronounced. Every letter has a pronunciation value. So how do we get from knicht to night? You know, how do you shorten, not this one, but this one? N-I-T-E, right? Why do you have to have the E? Because it makes the I long. <laughs> Otherwise, you have right? So how, how did that happen? Go back to the Norman Conquest. Because what sound do Frenchies don't like one of them? How many French words begin with <gasps> None. No aspiration at the beginning. That's what that sounds called. At the beginning of a word. Which is why in French, when you see this word, H-E-U-R-E-S, it's not hours. <laughs> it's hour. Trésor. If you have that at the beginning, then this carries over, so it becomes trezur, and you elide that H. Why can you have in English, depending upon what you're reading, you can see hint and it, and they're both referring to the same thing. Okay. Partially, it's somewhat, to some extent at least, Apostrophe S. What does apostrophe S mean? Possessive. Possessive. Or contraction. Okay. So when it's possessive, what does it mean? See, the apostrophe, even there, is an anomaly. The apostrophe is not etymologically correct. Because the apostrophe means this is being shortened. It's an elision. Well, what's being shortened? Is. Shakespeare writes, Mars, his sword. Mars, his sword. Mars's sword. But in, speak, in speech, in performance of plays, People aren't very clearly enunciating every sound there is. Why? Because that sounds robotic and is not pleasant to listen to for four hours. So, Mars's sword. What just happened to the at the beginning of his? It's eliding over. So when we use an apostrophe to indicate possession today, wrong. It's wrong. Um, spelling reform, Noah Webster tried it. He succeeded a little bit, but he didn't get everything he wanted. Uh, George Bernard Shaw advocated spelling reform. We'll see a guy back in 13th century named Orm, O-R-M, advocated spelling reform. How do we know? Because he used his own idiosyncratic spelling reform <laughs> in this massively dull 30,000 line long poem that nobody reads, right? Where he spells things very specifically. He uses double consonants to indicate a long vowel before. All throughout, he's very consistent. Received pronunciation, that's British speak. British received pronunciation is like the Queen's English or Prince Charles's English. English dialects and social status. You can't tell me that they're not important because it is. How do you know? Read the Harry Potter stories. There's a character, major character, prominent character, all seven books, who is looked down upon by one segment of society because of how he speaks. Because he uses words like ter. Not to, your, not your, etc. Okay? 
teaching the history of English language K through 12 schools, technology neologism in English. After all, you will talk about people, you know, interfacing with others. <laughs> Think about what that word means. Inter means between face, so French kissing, <laughs> or matrix, you know, faces morphing into <laughs> other. No, you interact. But what other kinds of things? What's this? Keyboard. Why is it called a keyboard? Do you see a key anywhere on this thing? No. So why is it not called a button board? Because those are more like buttons than they are keys. But they're not like these kind of buttons. So why do we have this kind of button and the kind of button you push? Hmm. What else? English is a world language. It is the world language. Yeah, there are more native Chinese speakers than there are native English speakers. But you want to learn to fly a plane and you want to learn to fly that plane internationally, you have got to speak English. Why? Every flight control tower in the world, English is the language spoken. You can't have somebody flying from Botswana to New York speaking Swahili because uh, they're not going to be a translator. They all have to learn to speak clear English. Okay? Um, slang, cuss, swear words, really, really interesting topic. Okay? Especially where the word slang comes from because we're not 100% sure. Some thinks it comes from some think it comes from a word that means to sling something. Like when you sling mud. Okay? It's words that you sling, in other words. Okay? <laughs> you from <laughs> Euphemistic language? I had a very good friend of my family. I'll use euphemistic language. Reposed in the Lord yesterday. Or passed away. Or we can, you know, he didn't what? Die. Kick the bucket. You know, pushing up daisies, etc. Because euphemistic means beautiful. We can have dysphemistic language also. <laughs> Semantic change. How do words change in meaning over time? Because the word G-A-Y used to have a meaning that just meant what? Happy. Today, it doesn't mean that anymore. If somebody is described as being gay, it is restricted to one meaning now. All right? Language and propaganda, language and politics. Almost read any politician. Well, don't, because most of them can't write. Um, but if you take this topic, you have got to read George Orwell's Politics in the English Language. Probably one of the greatest essays written in the 20th century. Okay? Um, where Orwell says a lot of stuff, and he gives budding writers some advice. For example, never use a metaphor you've seen before. The Vonder is like, what do you mean? Never use, a, never use a metaphor you have seen before. So, if you're going to use a metaphor, make it up. So what do you use a metaphor for? It's a figure of speech, right? You're trying to communicate an idea. But you don't want to just come out kind of prosaically and say what that thing is. When 9-11 um, happened, Tony Blair came to the United States stood next to George Bush at the White House and said, we stand shoulder to shoulder. That's a metaphor. What's the metaphor? Physical proximity. Physical proximity to? It's an image, right? But what's it of? It goes back thousands of years to the ancient Greeks who would stand shoulder to shoulder in a phalanx with their spear, or with their shield, and their sword. Why? Because if you're shoulder to shoulder, 
and your shields are interlocked, there's no daylight. Nobody can come between you. Nobody can destroy you. That's why the Greek phalanx was such a fearsome force. Or the Anglo-Saxon shield wall. Same kind of idea. Today, do we have soldiers who literally fight so, uh, shoulder to shoulder? No. Why? Because we have advanced weaponry where you take the enemy out 500 yards away. Okay? So it's an old, worn out metaphor. English, non-English, and assimilation into American culture. In other words, should people who come to the United States be required to learn English? You could throw on there, you know, should English be the national language? French is the national language of France. English is the national language of Britain. German, guess what? It's the national language of Germany, okay? But this is not the United States of English, is it? It's the United States of America, right? So what's the difference kind of there? And then all this stuff at the bottom I'm going to skip for right now, since we only have seven minutes left. So let me uh, exit that. Any questions so far? So I've got all this other stuff. I had all this other stuff up here. Let me get rid of some of this. Let's go talk tonight. An example of spelling slash sound change. Look at this O-U-G-H. And I've got the hyphen before it because the hyphen means this never exists on its own in English. You never just write down in a word, in a paper, in a text, in an email, O-U-G-H, because your recipient's going to go, what are you smoking? There's something wrong there. But it does get used in a variety of words. There's another one with a different pronunciation than these that I, and I never write it down, and I can never remember it. I'll remember it in a couple weeks. Um, it might be ought, but it, there's a difference there because you've got that final phony. So you've got bow. So let's put, you know, what is it? Uh, homonym spelled the spelled different, but sounds the same, like that. Through, you could use that. Though, do we have another spelling for that? Other than the shortened cough, enough. And again, this one doesn't quite work because of the. If, if we had, there's another one. I think that it is that sound, but I just, I'm drawing a blank on it. So, ow, ooh. O, off, uh, off, sorry, off, and off. How does O U G H get five different pronunciations? French. It's because of the influence of French. Okay. That's just a little example of, you know, it's this kind of chaos that makes English one of the hardest languages to learn. Or at least English spelling. Because it seemingly doesn't make any sense. I mean, I had defense with S-E and defense with C-E. How, how, you know, how do you know the difference between these in terms of the pronunciation. How do you know one's a hard k and the other one's a soft s? Well, intellectually, you, you don't necessarily. It just kind of naturally happens. But 
pretty much whenever this shows up in front of what's called a front vowel or a high front vowel or a tense front vowel, okay, like this or this, it's going to have the s sound. If it shows up in front of a back vowel, like that or that or that, That it's going to have the k sound. All right. What's this? G H O T I. I mentioned George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw advocated spelling reform. Shaw was the one, if I remember correctly, came up with this. It's the same pronunciation as fish. It, it. Shaw said, just makes absolutely no sense at all. And so people have been trying to reform the, language, the, the spelling of the language, like I said, since Orm back in the 13th century. Right? Now, in the 13th century, English spelling was, <laughs> you're from the North Midlands of England, you're from Southeast England, you're from Southwest England, you're from Scotland, England. Spell it how you want. What does that mean? Spell it like you talk. And guess what? We're still doing it. People still do that. Right? Because I hear, I get papers. In the Middle Ages, because of the courtly love tradition, women were put on, I am not kidding, I have had papers with this on it. Pedal stools. <laughs> so stools with pedals on them. So she could do her spin class. <laughs> um, I must of gone to the store. Must of. Notice again what that is an example of. It's must What's happening? We are eliding that H A sound from it. And because there is no word with just V E, well, there's gotta be this then. Okay. Hopefully by the end of the semester, we'll be able to explain somewhat, maybe not entirely, all of this. Okay, so for Thursday. Read chapters one and two. Don't spend an great amount of time. Don't you don't need to memorize, you know, the diagram of the mouth and all that kind of stuff. But I do want you to, if you haven't already, print out this this handout that I've uploaded with these notes. Okay, language fundamentals, a phonetic alphabet. Okay, because we're going to be doing some things in class with this phonetic alphabet. I'm going to ask you for a word, and I will transcribe that word on the board according to what you've said. <laughs> or I will say a word and have you tell me how to write that word in this phonetic alphabet. And sometimes I will accentuate parts of the word, and other times I won't. Okay. Why am I doing all this? Because you really need to learn this phonetic alphabet. This, this will be important in terms of learning how to represent sounds right, in, um, in papers. All right. We'll stop.